Yeah? Okay. So you may remember that the, on the last Sunday, for those of you who were here of 2018, I shared from a passage from Isaiah chapter 43. And I used three concepts or words that, uh, that were in that passage. And one was remember, remembering what God has done for us, right, as we finish the year, the great work that he's done in our own individual lives, the things that he's done here at New Vine as a church body. And then the second uh, concept was to forget, right? Um, forgetting and forsaking all of the discouragement, all of the despair um, and defeat that we may have gone through, um, not clinging or holding on to the past or even our current situation uh, if it's difficult in our circumstances, and to really give that up to him so that he can deal with it. And then the third concept or the third verb was to see, um, to, to open our eyes because in that passage it said, see, God says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Um, to open our eyes and to see the new things that God is doing in our midst, um, whether it be in our own lives, whether it be um, here at New Vine, uh, and to be aware of how God might be moving, to be sensitive, and whether or not we're able to surrender to him and to give him permission to do a new thing. Um, and then as we started this new year, and we're actually now into our second month of this new year, can you believe it, it's now February, I wanted to just kind of check in with you to see how your vision is. Um, are you seeing, are you getting a sense of what God is doing in your life this year? Um, are you getting a sense of where God may be leading you or even New Vine this year? And then you'll remember that uh, a few weeks ago, Pastor Ted finished up his uh, uh, sermon series on the book of Acts and you know, how we learn so much from the early church. And then a couple weeks ago, I posed the question of why church? And asked you why, to, why you come to New Vine, why some of you come every week, why some of you call this your spiritual home. Um, and we looked at a couple of passages that describe the nature of the church. We looked at uh, a, a, a couple of verses in Matthew chapter nine, where Jesus was hanging out with the Pharisees and he was hanging out uh, with uh, other tax, well, he was hanging out with not, he was hanging out with the tax collectors and, and other sinners, but the Pharisees happened to also be there. Um, but he was actually questioned by the Pharisees as to why he would be hanging out with sinners and people of ill repute. And we were reminded that the church really is meant for the lost and for sinners, just like you and me. And that for those that are spiritually sick, we're reminded that the church is meant to be a hospital. It's not meant to um, be a country club. Um, it's not meant to be a place that um, is necessarily always comfortable either. Um, and that like a hospital, it's a place where sick people can come, where the Lord can grant his healing and his restoration and his transformation and um, change our lives. And then there was that passage where Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talked about the body. Um, you remember how Paul compared the body of Christ to our own physical bodies, how we have different body parts and how it all, they all work together as one body and just the intricacies in our own human bodies. But how each one of us in the body of Christ has a unique part to play. How we may all, and we're all different, you know, different walks of life, different, we're different backgrounds from different places. We speak different languages. We may speak different dialects. But that's really the beauty of Christ's family is that we're so unique and different and that we all need to function well as a body, um, that no part is unimportant, no part is um, less than the other, but we all function together. Um, and the question that I pose, one of the questions that I pose is, do you know the function that God wants you to play in this local body of Christ? Um, and even as we continue to ponder the topic of church and how God is building the body here at New Vine, Today I want to focus on one word, and that word is next. Now what comes to mind when you think of the word next? Um, well, maybe for one, your definition of next might be, well, that's just what comes immediately after, you know, whatever comes after this. Maybe you're thinking, oh, next. Okay, for those of you who are hungry, I'm looking forward to the potluck dinner because I don't know, you know, what special dish is going to be upstairs. Um, or maybe some of you are saying, well, next, I know what's next. I'm going to watch the Super Bowl. I'm going to watch the Patriots or the Rams beat the other team. I know Pastor Ted is hoping that his 
prophecy or hope will come true, where he's hoping that the Patriots will, will, will beat the Rams like they did how many years ago? <laughs> 17 years ago, right? So, so what is next? You know, perhaps as a kid, your parents had a schedule that you always knew what was next, where you would wake up, you would get ready, <laughs> right? You would have breakfast, you would go to school, you would come home, you would do your homework, you would have dinner, maybe you would take a shower or a bath, and then you would go to bed. And then you would repeat the same thing all over again the next day. And you always knew what was next as a kid, right? Elementary school, okay, what's after that? Junior high school, middle school, high school, college, get a job, get married, have kids, raise them, retire, and rest, <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of what's next, right? But I think as we get older, there may be perhaps more ambiguity or more unknowns about what might be next. Um, perhaps another way to look at it may be, perhaps there are more options or choices of what may come next. Um, like, what classes should I take, uh, for those of you who are in school? Um, or what major or career should I go into? Or what job should I get? Rosa, you're interviewing tomorrow, right? What job should I get, right? Is Stanford Hospital the job for you? Or for some of our single brothers and sisters, who should I marry? Should I even get married? Where should I live? What's next for your stage in your life? Or what's next for us as a church here at New Vine? You know, as we get older, the concept of next is definitely less prescribed by our parents and may at times be uncertain or even unsure. Sometimes there's a bit of angst, right? There's a bit of, oh, I don't know what to do next. You know, my parents aren't able to tell me what to do next. Maybe I'm a little lost. Maybe I'm a little confused. Maybe I'm in a daze and I need to kind of figure out what's next. You know, so many decisions to make until the next thing happens or until the next step especially as it relates to your life or my life today. Now today I wanna to spend the rest of our time focusing on this concept of next and how it relates to us as individuals, um, perhaps what the Bible has to say, and also not just as individuals, but also as a body of Christ, as New Vine Community Church, what is next? What does God have next for you? What does God have next for me? What does God have next for us together as a family? Now, perhaps the best way to illustrate our spiritual life and the life of a pretty t relatively new church is to think about developmental stages you know, of, of growing up. So, you know, of course, for, for those of you who are parents, you know, infant, newborn, and then toddler, preschool, elementary school, et cetera, right? There are obviously milestones. And for those of you who aren't parents, as you were growing up, you had particular milestones as you were growing up, right? And that was kind of like what was next for you um, as you grew as a person, right? Now, the first passage of scripture that I want to look at is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. And I'm going to ask you uh, to read it with me together. Let's all read this together. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You know, the, the Bible talks about a new believer drinking spiritual milk, right? Just like a newborn needs milk, right? Actually, it talks about this newborn craving milk, right? It talks about this spiritual newborn craving spiritual milk. Now, the word crave, I mean, it's, it's very descriptive, right? It's, it's you know, I, I, I sorry, I, I'm just trying to think about, like, this whole concept of a, of a newborn, right? What's interesting is, is newborns have an innate sucking instinct. Like, no, it's, it, it's interesting. No one, like, you don't teach a newborn how to drink milk. They just, they just know. They just know how to, to instinctively suck and drink milk, right? And it's pretty amazing, right? They, they automatically know 
what it takes to, to, to feed, right? They get hungry and they want milk. I mean, if, a, if you hear a newborn and he or she is hungry, they scream and they want milk. You know, when, when we first had Josiah, he was spending, he unfortunately had to spend the first week in the NICU, in the neonatal intensive care unit. And we could tell it was him because it was, I mean, his cry was so loud, but they crave, they're so hungry that they want milk, right? But as spiritual babies, Peter is saying that as spiritual babies, we're supposed to crave milk. We're supposed to like want to, to, to eat that, that milk, right? Otherwise, we'll starve to death, right? Now, but another phrase in this passage is that it says, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now, those two words, grow up, okay? They're, it's an act, these are active words, right? The Bible talks about growing up spiritually. You know, it, it, it challenges us. Like, we cannot always just drink spiritual milk. We need to grow up. We need to grow up into maturity. Just like a newborn, he or she will eventually transition from milk to solid food, right? And as, as people of God, we can't just drink spiritual milk. We need to move on to solid food. Now, some of us are newer Christians, and it's appropriate for us to drink spiritual milk, right? Perhaps as newer Christians, when you were a newer Christian, you used to crave milk and, and you wanted to study God's word. You're like, oh, what is this Bible all about? You know, what are the gospels? And, and you had this desire, you had this interest to look into the word of God and study it. But then maybe as you got a little bit more older in the faith or more mature, perhaps that craving for for God's word wasn't as great, or perhaps that craving for spiritual milk wasn't as great. But then maybe perhaps you progressed to solid food. But then there may be others of us who have been Christians for longer. And while spiritual milk may still be tasty, we actually need to move from spiritual milk to solid food. Otherwise, it's just not very appropriate. Like you, you, you don't, you don't really see like 10 year olds just drinking milk, right? You don't even see five year olds just, just, just drinking milk. They also eat food, right? Like solid food, right? And so as we grow in our spiritual walks, as you and I grow, we need to move from spiritual milk to solid food. There's another passage in Hebrews chapter five, verses 11 to chapter six, verse three. I'm gonna invite you all to, to read this together as well. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, through this time, you, to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not spiritual food, solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. You know, it's, it's very similar concept, you know, but it, it goes, he, the writer of Hebrews goes back to verse 12 where he says, you know, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers. There, so there were some people that he was addressing that had been in the faith for a very long time and they should have been teachers already of God's word. But instead he's saying they still needed milk. Now I understand that we all have different developmental milestones, physically, but also spiritually, right? Um, you know, when I think about, again, going back to a physical illustration about kids, when I think about our three kids, um, Josiah walked when he was 12 months, 12, not, not 12, 12 months, okay? Which is, which is um, pretty, I think, pretty standard, right? Enoch around 13 months, so still kind of pretty standard. But Esther, on the other hand, she didn't walk until she was 22 months, until she was almost two years old. 
so there was a point of time where we were very concerned. Um, like, is she okay? Like, we actually had to send her to a specialist, and they recommended some physical therapy. But then when she went to physical therapy, she screamed. She would not even let the physical therapist touch her. And, you know, because they were show, trying to show us some exercises to kind of help her with her movement. And, and she was, if, for those of you who know Esther, she's very... Um, principled, and she has her own thoughts, and she's very set in her opinions, and, and she did not want us to, to force things upon her. And it wasn't until 22 months that she learned to walk. Um, and we realized that, that when she set her mind to something, she would actually do it. Um, and the other example is potty training. Okay, so Josiah, he finally was potty trained when he was three, okay? But for Esther, she potty trained when she was 22 months. So she potty, it was flipped, right? So you would think, oh no, it's gonna be like another hard thing to train her, right? But no, she saw her brother going to the bathroom and she wanted to sit on the potty. But it was different developmental stages, right? But it was interesting because because for each kid, it was a different time frame. But as we think about our spiritual walking, our spiritual maturity, our spiritual growth, Paul is saying, or not Paul, the, the, the writers in, in, in 1 Peter and Hebrews, there's a time when we need to be drinking milk but there's also a time when we need to move on. There's also a time that we need to eat spiritual food. There's also a time in our spiritual lives that we need to grow up. Because otherwise, you, you don't really, you shouldn't really see a 20 year old just drinking milk. There would be something wrong. There would be something abnormal, right? If you just saw an adult just drinking milk you would wonder what's going on, right? Maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's some digestion issue or, or something, right? You know, these two passages of scripture that we just read reminds us that we should be growing in our spiritual walk and that God wants us to mature. He does not want us to stay where we are. He does not want us to remain as spiritual infants, as spiritual babies. He wants us to mature. He wants us to go from spiritual infants to toddlers, from a toddler to a preschooler, from a preschooler to a kindergartner, to elementary school. He wants us to keep on going to what is next. You know, spiritual maturity and growth, they don't just happen. There needs to be an intentionality to it. There needs to be a desire for growth and for what's next. You know, coming to church a couple hours a week, it's just not gonna do it. If you think about the amount of time that you spend in church, maybe a couple hours max, and you think about the total number of hours in the whole week, two hours out of 168 hours, that's 1.2%. That's just 1.2%. You can't assume that you're gonna grow spiritually just by coming here and meeting with your fellow brothers and sisters for a couple hours. You can't assume that listening to the preacher, you're gonna automatically grow spiritually. I mean, what, we just, 30 minutes, 40 minutes max? You can't assume that, oh, well, that's how I'm gonna be fed. That's one way of being fed, but that's not it. You cannot base your, spirit, your own spiritual growth on what you, solely receive here at church. There needs to be an intentionality if we want to grow spiritually. If we want to stop being like a spiritual baby, and if we want to grow up, we need to be intentional about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Throughout the week, starting each day with Him in prayer, reading His Word, not just Reading it for the sake of, oh, I did my time with God today. I read through whatever scripture passages. But really, taking his word in, meditating on his word, spending time with God throughout the day. For some of you who have a long commute, are you able to commune with him in the car? Are you able to pray?
pray? Are you able to worship? Are you able to invite him to your workplace? Are you able to say, God, I need you. And this is the promise that I read about in your word today. And help me to remember that promise throughout the day. You know, our spiritual growth takes an intentionality. You cannot expect other people to feed you. You can only expect that for so long as a baby. But soon enough, you need to be able to feed yourself. I need to be able to feed myself, right? An example is the soul care group. What a wonderful opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters, to share, to go deeper about what does it mean you know, to have the Lord do deeper work in our soul, in our lives. There needs to be a commitment that each of us has to make to say, you know what? I've been a Christian for X number of months or X number of years or X number of decades. And it's time that I take my faith seriously. It's time to say, God, what is next for me? What is this next level that you want me to, to go to? How is this spiritual growth gonna look like? Does God want to increase your prayer life this year? Does God want to take you from just maybe saying grace each day to maybe spending a little bit more time with him each day? I'm not saying hours, okay? Let's, let's do it little by little, you know? But maybe from saying grace each day to, okay, I'm gonna pray for five minutes each day. I'm gonna commune with God. Whatever I read from the Bible, I'm just gonna say, God, help me to apply it into my life. Or maybe taking it, you know, maybe you pray for 10 minutes. Maybe say, okay, God, help me to pray each day for 15 minutes. Help me to pray for 20 minutes. I'm encouraging you to take small steps in your walk with God, to grow, to take a step to grow spiritually. Maybe it's not prayer. Maybe it's reading God's word. Maybe it's like, oh, I don't, you know, every time, and I've heard this before, every time that I open God's word, I don't really understand. You know, it, it kind of, it, 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 I don't get it, right? And that's okay. But maybe it's saying, hey, is there someone here at New Vine that I could maybe perhaps be intentional with and say, could I read the Bible with you? Maybe once a week or maybe once a month? Could we get together for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Could we maybe, and I've seen some of you do this upstairs, after dinner, could we just sit aside, lay aside like 15 minutes? I had a question about this passage. Can, you, can we go over it together? Can we explore what is this truth that God is trying to teach us? You know, little things like that. You know, if we're not intentional, we're just gonna stay as spiritual babies and we're not gonna grow. We're not gonna be able to see the next thing that God may have for us as he grows us closer with him. So I wanna ask you to think about one thing in your spiritual walk that perhaps God is inviting you to this year. Perhaps God is saying, you know what? This is what I wanna do in your life next. And I wanna ask you, even as we continue this afternoon, to commit that one thing to the Lord. Maybe it's prayer, maybe it's reading the Bible. And I'm not saying you have to read the whole Bible in a year. I know some of us do that, which is great, but for most of us, we may not do that, and that's okay. But even like starting somewhere, it doesn't matter where, okay? But maybe taking like a book of the Bible, like the Psalms, or one of the Gospels, like John or Mark, and saying, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pick a book and I'm gonna commit to reading a little bit each day. And I'm gonna ask God, I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to guide me into his truth. I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate my mind so I can understand. And if I don't understand, I'm gonna seek someone out at church and say, hey, would you mind? Let's read this together and ask the Lord to show us what this means. 
Maybe it's doing something else in your growth to spiritual maturity. Maybe for some of you, God is saying, well, maybe you need to share Jesus with your neighbor. Maybe it's reaching out to a friend. Maybe it's caring for someone. Maybe it's inviting someone over for dinner. What is that next step that God is asking you to take? Now, when I was thinking about the word next and the next thing, I was thinking about or brainstorming with Cheryl before this message, like what are some obstacles that perhaps we may have to what's next? Um, And the first thing that came to my mind was, well, a lot of times I don't really want the next thing because I'm just comfortable, right? I'm I'm good, like I'm at a good spot, right? Like, um, well, there's comfortable, there's complacency, and then for me, there's always being lazy too. So so it's kind of like, I'm at a good spot, why? I'm enjoying life, everything's going well, or it seems to be going well. I'm doing okay, I've worked hard, and now I just wanna coast. I just want to like ride it out. Why would I want something next? Why would I want anything new? You know, and it it, it kind of reminded me of a time when, um, when this is probably like, um, I don't know, way back in 2003. Um, I, you know, I was, um, I was working at a smaller biotech firm, and, and I'd been with this firm for about six years, and I was pretty, I'm, I'm a pretty loyal employee, so I've been with them, and it was a very small firm, um, and, and it was, things were going well, or so it seemed, um, but then what happened is one by one, like we, we, our, our small firm got bought out by this kind of bigger firm, and then like, um, and that was kind of exciting, but then it was like, that firm wasn't doing well, and then one by one, people started getting laid off, and I was kind of like the only one left in my group, and I was like, oh, this is not bad, I still have a paycheck, right? But I think I was just really comfortable and really complacent. Like, I knew what I was supposed to do, you know, I knew the, 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 the sites that I visited, the, I knew the people, and I was just really comfortable. And then there was this recruiter who kept calling me, like, very, very faithfully, month after month after month. And month after month after month, I would say, no, I'm not interested, and to to a next job, right? And, but what's interesting is, somehow, there was this one time when the same recruiter called me, pestered me about the same job, that somehow I was kind of like, well, maybe I should just hear him out. Maybe I should just check out whatever he has to say. And then sure enough, it was about, you know, this job, that was further up, but it was a bigger, bigger firm, much bigger firm. Um, and I was like, well, I wouldn't hurt. I guess I was thinking, well, you know, maybe, you know, I, cause when he said, oh, you know, so-and-so is a hiring manager and I knew this person from another job I had. And I was like, oh, it wouldn't hurt to talk to this person. And so one thing led to another and I actually went up for an interview cause I was hoping to see that person, but I ended up never meeting that person because She already knew me and she was like, yeah, I'll just interview the team. But to to put a long story short, what ended up happening is I actually got the job and it was an amazing opportunity. But I was so complacent at my other job that I was just so comfortable that I felt like I didn't necessarily want a next thing for me. But in God's grace, in his own timing, he allowed me, like literally that job just landed on my lap. I didn't have to do anything. Like there are a lot of people that are so much more ambitious than me that would have died to work at that company, right? That would have died to be in, in this like we're very well-known company. But I was kind of like, oh, whatever, you know? But in God's grace, he allowed me to get into that opportunity. And, and I was there for 13, 14 years. And God opened more opportunities and, 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 and just amazing things that I would have never experienced had I just been in that smaller firm. So brothers and sisters, God doesn't want us to settle. He doesn't want us to be complacent. Although it may be comfortable, although you may seem like, hey, life is good, 
we really need to be on our guard. Are we settling for second or third best instead of maybe what God has else for us? Maybe something that's even better if we allowed him to. And then another obstacle to what might be next is, I think another thing is, and it's very common, fear, right? Fear of the unknown, fear of taking next steps, fear of, um, like, why should I rock the boat, right? I'm comfortable, things are going well. Why should I venture out into the unknown? Why should I look for another job when my job's fine? But this is where faith comes in. Right? If you feel like God is giving you a next assignment or something next, if God's inviting you to do something new, don't you think he's going to give you the ability to pursue that? Don't you think if God is opening that next door for you, that God is going to supply you with that faith to step out in faith, and then when you do, God's going to take you to the next step and continue to guide you. A third obstacle that I was thinking about is, you know, sometimes we're just preoccupied. And not not only are we, you know, complacency and laziness or whatever aside, sometimes we're just preoccupied with other things, right? I mean, we live in a very busy area. Like, we live in Silicon Valley. We're busy people, you know. um, uh, You know, some of you are raising kids. Right? Some of you are working full-time jobs. Some of you are trying to just kind of get by and make, like, barely survive sometimes. That's how, sometimes that's how I feel, right? But where do we draw the line with our preoccupation with other things when it comes to what's next? When it comes to the next thing that God would want for you? Where do we draw the line? Do we draw the line? Do we say, okay, I know God wants to do something, but perhaps I'm not allowing him to do something. And if that's the case, what is it that is standing in the way of what God wants to do next in your life? There's a third passage of scripture in Philippians chapter one, verse six. And this is one of my favorite verses. Um, I'll just read this. It says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, trusting our God who started this good work in you and me, that he will bring us to maturity in him. Trusting that whatever thing that God has started in your heart, in your life, and in mine, that God will carry it on to completion. We don't know what that may look like just yet, right? Because our stories are not done yet. God is still, thankfully, at work in our lives. We are a work in progress. He's not finished with us yet. And thankfully, you know, by his goodness and by his grace, he's not done with us yet, right? But God desires to mature you and I. He desires to make us even more beautiful than we are now, even more effective than we are now, even more loving than you may think you are now, even more forgiving than you may think you are now, even more a warrior for him than you may feel like you are now. God's still at work in us. But the key is, we need to allow him freedom to continue that work. We need to allow him to say, yes, Lord, I want to take this next step in my spiritual life. I actually want to mature. I don't want to stay stagnant. And that's the lie of the enemy. Satan comes in and basically he says, hey, you're fine. You don't need to grow more. You've been a Christian all these years. You're actually doing so much better than the guy sitting next to you. You're fine. But that's a lie. 
That's a lie, brothers and sisters. We should not succumb to stagnation. We should not succumb to just settling. We always should be asking, God, what is that next thing? What is it that you want for my life? How is it that you want to propel me to this next level in spiritual intimacy with you? Are we giving him that freedom to mold us, to grow us, to bring us to spiritual maturity? to give him permission to do what is next. You know, as we were talking mostly about ourselves and our path to spiritual maturity and, and how we shouldn't just crave milk but go to transition to solid food. But I was just thinking about also us corporately as a church, as New Vine Community Church. You know, I, I mean, we're almost two and a half years old, right? So this March will be two and a half, right? So kind of like a toddler, right? We're kind of walking, you know, we're not, we're not an infant anymore. We're kind of like, you know, able to stand on our own or whatever, or, or stand and, and kind of take some steps or whatever. And it's been amazing what God has done in our midst these last two and a half years, right? We first started off just as a dream. You know, you've heard the story. 30 so, 20 or 30 of us from our San Jose church, you know, started praying regularly and meeting with Pastor Ted and Sandy and, and started dreaming each month about what a church plant might look like. And, and, and we know, and, and as we were preparing to, to, to start meeting regularly here in Mountain View, you know, we had some activities. You know, a few years ago, we had a huge Super Bowl party. We had some community events. We had some picnics. And then we mailed out some flyers right before we, we started meeting. And then some of you found out about New Vine because of the flyers. And, and it's just been amazing how the Lord has brought all of us here. And it's been a beautiful story, right? of how God is building his church here in Mountain View. But that's not the end of the story. That's just the beginning of the story. Two and a half years, that's not a long time, right? We can't just stop here. God has something next in store for New Vine. There's something more that God wants to do here at 360 South Shoreline, okay? That's just the physical location, right? But again, the church is not a building, it's you and I. God wants to do so much more in our faith community, in our family. He wants to do so much more, but are we gonna let him? Or are we just gonna say, you know what? Things are nice, I have my group of friends, we eat dinner every Sunday night, we hang out together, it's fine, it's nice. We can't just stop here because there's something next that God wants us to do. I want you to pray and dream with us about what that next assignment might be for us as a church. How does he want New Vine to be as we grow up, as we start preschool, as we go into kindergarten? What are the new things that God is gonna do in our midst? How many more stories of healing, of transformation, of coming to know the Lord do we get to hear about or do we get to witness? How are we to join him in his work? And I want to end by reading an excerpt from one of uh, Charles Wendell's book, Growing Strong in the Seasons of Life. It's a parable um, about saving lives. On a dangerous sea coast, notorious for shipwrecks, there is a crude little life-saving station. Actually, the station was merely a hut with only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the turbulent sea. With little thought for themselves, they would go out day and night tirelessly searching for those in danger as well as the lost. Many, many lives were saved by this brave band of men who faithfully worked as a team in and out of the life-saving station. By and by, it became a famous place. Some of those who had been saved as well as others along the seacoast wanted to become associated with this little station. They were willing to give their time 
and energy and even money in support of its objectives. New boats were purchased. New crews were trained. The station that was once obscure and crude and virtually insignificant began to grow. Some of its members were unhappy that the hut was so unattractive and poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided. Emergency cots were replaced with lovely furniture. Rough handmade equipment was discarded and sophisticated classy systems were installed. The hut, of course, had to be torn down to make room for the additional equipment, furniture, systems, and appointments. By its completion, the life-saving station had become a popular gathering place, and its objectives had begun to shift. It was now used as sort of a clubhouse, an attractive building for public gatherings, saving lives, feeding the hungry, strengthening the fearful, and calming the disturbed rarely occurred by now. Fewer members were now interested in braving the sea on life-saving missions. So they hired professional lifeboat crews to do all this work. The original goal of the station wasn't altogether forgotten, however. The life-saving motifs still prevailed in the club's decorations. In fact, there was a liturgical lifeboat preserved in the Room of Sweet Memories with soft, indirect lighting, which helped hide the layer of dust upon the once-used vessel. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the, boats, and the boat crews brought in loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty, terribly sick, and lonely. Others were different from the majority of the club members. The beautiful new club suddenly became messy and cluttered. A special committee saw to it that a shower house was immediately built outside, away from the club, so victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there were strong words and angry feelings, which resulted in a division among the members. Most of the people wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities and all involvement with shipwreck victims. It's too unpleasant. It's a hindrance to our social life. It's opening the door to folks who are not our kind. As you'd expect, some still insisted upon saving lives. This was their primary objective, that their only reason for existence was ministering to anyone needing help, regardless of their cub's beauty or size or decorations. They were voted down and told if they wanted to save the lives of various people, of, of various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. As years passed, the new station experienced the same old changes. It evolved into another club, and yet another life-saving station was begun. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that coast today, you'll find a large number of exclusive, impressive clubs along the shoreline, owned and operated by slick professionals who have lost all involvement with the saving of lives. Shipwrecks still occur in those waters, but now most of the victims are not saved. Every day they drown at sea, and so few seem, seem to care, so very few. Of course, this is a, a parable, but it's our hope and prayer that as a church community, we don't just stop here. We don't just turn into a social club of sorts. We don't get comfortable, but we will still operate as a hospital. That we will still bring those who need Jesus to the Savior. That we will still bring and welcome those that may be different from us. That we will still bring and, and, and pray for and minister and rally and bring people to the foot of the cross because Jesus has come for not just you and me, but for all of us. So as we come together, as we conclude tonight, I just wanna ask you, 
as you think about your own life, what is it that the Lord has next for you in your own spiritual walk with him? For some of us, are we still drinking milk? And it's fine if it's appropriate. But for those of us who have been believers for many, many years, should we have moved on to solid food? What is this next thing that God is asking you to do this year in your own life, in your spiritual walk with him? Is there one area that you want to ask the Lord to say, God, I want you to grow me in this way. What is it that God is asking you to? And then even as a church community, what is next for us as New Vine? How can we continue to be on the path that God has called out for us as a church body here in this area? We can't be complacent. We can't get comfortable. We need to keep asking the Lord, God, what is next for us? I'm gonna invite you to stand. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come up. Even as we prepare for communion this evening, even as you reflect on, on some of those things for your own life about what's next, and about your path to maturity. You know, Jesus came to die on the cross for us so that we could have a next, so that we could grow in him. Jesus came and shed his blood. His body was broken on the cross so that you and I could have a next. Jesus doesn't want us to just linger, to just stay stagnant, to just remain an infant. But I wanna ask you to prepare your hearts today as we celebrate what he's done on the cross for us. To not only ask him what is next for your life, but to also give him your heartfelt thanks. That to say, because Jesus, your body was broken for me, because your blood was shed for me, I could have a next. I could have this abundant life that you promise in your word. Brothers and sisters, let's stop playing church. Let's stop playing nice guy or nice gal. It's time that we take our faith seriously. And God's inviting us tonight to take our faith to the next level. So as we reflect, I'm just going to close in prayer. And then when you're ready, I want to invite you to come up and, and take the bread and to dip it into the, the cup and just reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you and I. God, we thank you for this table that you are inviting us to. Jesus, we thank you for the body of yours that was broken for us. We thank you for your blood that was poured out for us so that we could come into a personal relationship with you, so that we can be called children of God, sons and daughters of the Most High. Thank you, Jesus for giving us a next opportunity. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to celebrate what you've done on that cross 2,000 years ago. Lord, even as we come before you tonight, God, would you reveal to us perhaps some obstacles that are standing in the way of what you desire to do in our lives, of what is next for us. God, if it's any fear, we want to lay it at your feet. God, in place of fear, we ask, Lord, that you would give us faith. Lord, in place of complacency, we ask, God, that you would give us your empowerment, that you would give us, Lord, 
a sense of you at work, that you would give us, Lord, a sense of you desiring to work in our lives. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, if perhaps some of us are settling, yeah, that you would stir within us a desire for you to work again, a desire for you to do a new thing, a desire for you to see the next steps that you would have for each and every one of us. Lord, we pray, God, that you would come and reveal to us what might be next for us as your people, as your church body. Jesus, we thank you in advance. So when you're ready, I just want to invite you to come and observe the Lord's Supper. God, we thank you for our time together. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, that you desire to do new things in our lives. Lord, you desire us to grow in you. So, Lord, we pray that even as we come tonight, that, Lord, you would continue to speak to us, that you would continue to show us a specific area that you want us to commit to you, a specific area where you want us to grow deeper in you this year. Father, whether it be in the area of prayer, whether it be in the area of reading your word, whether it be in the area of worship, in communing with you each day, whether it be meditating upon your precepts. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would take us to spiritual maturity, Lord. We want to be intentional, Lord. We want to ask, God, that you would grow us, Lord, as your people. Lord, we no longer want to just be spiritual babies drinking milk, but, Lord, we want to be mature. We want to go on to eat solid food. Father, we ask, Lord, that even as a church, that, Lord, you would speak to us, Lord, as a new vine community, that you would show us the next step, continue to the next level. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to guide us as we seek you in that way. For it's in your name we pray.